Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Dave, and I'm going to be sharing with you all this morning. We've been uh, walking through the book of Mark, and uh, our series has been called On Your Market Set Go because the gospel of Mark is such a fast paced gospel, very much filled with action. And we are nearing the end of the story. And for our context this morning, um, the, the problem with really understanding the story of Palm Sunday is that we all know the spoiler alert, right? We know what happens. We know the end. We know that even though Jesus is walking down or riding down this street, going into Jerusalem as people are celebrating him, we know that five days later, what happens? Come on, First Communion kids. All right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Five days later, he's going to the cross. And then what happens after that? Yes, sir. You raised your hand so politely. What happens after that? He died on the cross for our sins. All right. Sermon's over. Amen. All right. Yeah, he dies on the cross for our sins and he rises again. We know the end of the story, right? Like, so it's, it's sort of been ruined We don't really understand the full context of Palm Sunday because we already know what's going to happen. But for the Jews, for the disciples, they had no idea. They had no idea what was, even though Jesus is starting to tell them and warn them, they really don't understand. And so this morning, I really want to spend some time talking about unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. There actually is a a Netflix movie, and there's another rival one on Hulu about this luxury music festival called Fire. Anyone, Anyone seen? All right, seven of you will understand this now. All right, so I'm gonna paint, you've all heard of a music festival before, right? Okay, so there's this luxury music festival, and it's, and it's going to be put on in the Bahamas. It was promoted by this rapper, Ja Rule, largely. And it was going to be called Fire, and it was to launch this new music app called Fire. Good job. You're quick learners. All right. Right? And so they're doing this music festival, and, and it was supposed to be VIP all the way. As they promoted it, they actually, they said, this wasn't true, but they said it was going to be on the private island of Pablo Escobar. Kind of add some intrigue. It was actually on Grand Exuma in the Bahamas, which is a little less ominous. I don't know. People have actually been there before and not gotten shot by a drug lord, right? And so they're promoting this festival. Tickets went for as much as $12,000 for this weekend, for this VIP experience. And so people came in and they were promised this luxury accommodations. There was going to be five-star cuisine. It was going to be authentic bohemian cuisine. Um, Everything about it was going to be top of the line, amazing, right? And if you saw the documentary, you already know what happens, but basically the music festival never even really got off its feet. It it was canceled before it even really happened. As people got there, this is what they actually found, and I apologize, the pictures are a little light, but the picture there on the left is their tents. Those, that's the luxury accommodation, $12,000. It's leftover FEMA tents. That's actually what it is. And you can see trash laying around on the floor, just this desolate area. On the right is the, is the, um, the excellent cuisine. It's a couple of pieces of bread, a couple of unwrapped slices of cheese, and a few pieces of lettuce with what appears to be, at one time, was a tomato on top. Are you kidding me? $12,000? I wouldn't pay $12 for that. And so people had these unmet expectations. To this day, there are lawsuits um, that are totaling over $100 million pending, trying to get money back from this, this what was supposed to be this experience that was amazing. And yet the expectations didn't add up to the reality. And I want us to pretend for a moment that we don't know the end of the story as we talk about Palm Sunday today. 
I want us to pretend for a moment because I think that will help us to really understand what is actually going on as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. Because the reality is all along, the disciples and the Jews, they did not expect the kind of Messiah they got. They were expecting a conquering king. They had long expected that the Messiah would come from the line of David. David, the greatest of all the Jewish kings, right? David, who killed Goliath. David, whose son Solomon built the temple in the first place. They expected this incredible experience of this royal blood coming up. Being born to pomp and circumstance and, and all kinds of fanfare. That's what they're looking forward to and expecting. Instead, they get Jesus. Born to Joseph. A lowly carpenter. Whose mom was a young virgin. Who's born not amidst fanfare, but born in a manger with animals. And so the, even from the beginning, the expectations don't meet the reality. And can you imagine, I mean, how many of you follow the royal family? You can be honest. I'm only going to make a little bit of fun of you. Right? And so, I mean, we know everything about the royal family, their whole childhood, right? Today... This is a horrible British accent, but today Prince William pooped three times. It was good consistency. And he's all clean now. Everything's good, right? I mean, we know everything about the royal family, their entire life. Everything. We know all of it. We know nothing about Jesus' childhood. Nothing. There's one story. One story about a time when Jesus wandered off and, and ended up in the temple. That's it. I mean, let's be honest. The British monarchs are not even real. They have a parliamentary system. They don't even really rule. And yet we know everything about them. And here is the Messiah. We know nothing about him. There's The expectations and the reality don't add up. And so you have Jesus coming in. And all of a sudden, for the very first time, People's expectations are starting to be met. Jesus, who spent his entire ministry around the Sea of Galilee and in kind of outlying areas away from the action, away from Jerusalem, finally is coming into Jerusalem. And he's finally coming in, and as he's coming in, he's not riding on a chariot as you would expect a conquering king, but he is on a donkey, a young colt. And he's riding in and the people are so excited. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And they're laying down palm fronds, which is what they did when a conquering king would return to a city. When he had just defeated another land. And they're expecting that Jesus is going to come in and finally they're going to be freed. Right? We've talked a little bit about the history of Israel and Time and again, they would wander away from God and another nation would conquer them and then God would send someone in to rescue them. A judge, a king, a prophet. Someone would rescue them and then they would be okay again. And they're expecting the Messiah to once and for all do this, to get them their promised land for good and to rid the Romans out of there. But Jesus is a different kind of Messiah. He's not the Messiah they want, but he is the Messiah that they need. And so as he comes in, he's not riding in a chariot, he's riding on this donkey, but still, people are still worshiping, right? He's coming in. If you look at this picture right now, this will help, I think, give you a little image. In the bottom right-hand corner, that's Bethpage and Bethany. That's where he's coming from. And that, that windy road that's going down the middle that goes to kind of that bridge, that's the Palm Sunday road. That's the road that he's ride, riding down. And, and all along this road, people are bowing. They're throwing their coats. And they're waving palm fronds. And they're singing. They're dancing. And they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. This is what it looks like from the very top. If you look, you see the wall there kind of in the middle of the picture? That's the edge of the temple area, the temple mount. You can see looking down. Here's a picture from about a year ago. 
There's in the middle, that's the prophet Vahan Varian. He's one of the lesser known prophets. Some people refer to him as the hugging prophet. If you don't know Vahan, he'll give you a hug later and introduce himself. But that's when we were in Israel, and we are literally walking down that Palm Sunday road, and as Jesus is riding down, people are waving palms, and they're saying, Hosanna. But here's the important thing. They're not saying Hosanna because they're praising God. They're not saying, yes, God has arrived. Yes, the Messiah who's going to save us from their sins. They're saying, yes, this guy is going to kick some Roman butt. That's literally what they're doing. They're like, yes, finally we're going to be free. And they have unmet expectations. This is the return of a conquering king. That's what the people think. They think that Jesus is coming back and he's going to conquer Rome. And he's going to free Israel. The Jews and the disciples, they still think of Jesus that way, right? Time and again. We just, a couple weeks ago, talked about an interaction with Jesus and Peter. Where Jesus finally kind of spills the beans. He finally tells them, no, this is what I'm here for. I'm coming to suffer and to die. What does Peter say? Do you remember? He's like, no! No way, Jesus. This is right after G- Peter finally acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, they think the Messiah is this gladiator figure that's going to free him. They don't know, like we do, the end of the story. They don't know what's going to happen. The only one that really knows what's going on is Jesus. And so as they're waving their palm fronds and they're praising him, what they're really doing is saying, yes, yes, we're going to be free. Yes, Rome is no longer. We'll have our promised land. The reality is what's going on is kind of something like this. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem and just as by the way, that, that noise the monkeys were making, uh, Bill Giggy translated it for me. That is Hosanna in monkey. So, um, and that's what they're, they're basically, you know, Simba's born. You guys have seen the Lion King before, probably all of you. And they're presenting him for the first time, and they're like, yes, the king. And that's what's going on here. Everyone's like, yes, the king, he's finally come to Jerusalem. He's finally coming in. But the reality is, Jesus is not coming in as a conquering king. He's coming in as a suffering servant. And no one knows. No one, no one understands or gets the full story here yet. Except for Jesus. And as he's riding into the city, he knows what's happening. I can only imagine how excited Peter must be, right? Peter, the guy who always looks, leaps before he looks, who speaks before he thinks. I can only imagine as they're going into the city and people are praising him, Peter's like, yeah, all right. I actually won that argument with Jesus. He's going to conquer the Romans. You know, Peter's just got to be so thrilled and excited and, and everyone is, and Jesus knows that he's riding to his death. And he's riding not to conquer, but to give himself up. And he knows what's in front of him, and yet he goes there because he loves us so much. Zechariah 9.9 says this, Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious. And that's, that's the piece of the picture that the Jews are visualizing right now. But the rest of the passage goes lowly riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And you, you get the full picture and you understand that Jesus is not coming to conquer. Not in the way they think, at least. He's coming to sacrifice. This is the return of the Messiah, but it's, it's not the one they want. It's, it's the one that they need. It's the one that they need. And so Jesus is not coming simply to put the Romans out and to give the Jews land, he's coming to give them something far better than that. He's coming to give them, to give us an eternal inheritance. As my co-pastor friend said earlier, right? Jesus is coming to die 
for our sins. He's not conquering the Romans. He's conquering something far better. He's conquering sin and death. As Jesus rides into the city, he's a Messiah that we all need because he's the one that can end our death problem, that can end our sin problem, that can break that separation that we have, that eternal separation from God, and can bring us back together. Jesus dies on the cross so that we don't have to. Jesus dies so that we can be made right with God. We celebrate that every week when we take communion. As you all are going to do for the very first time, that's what we're celebrating today. Jesus, as he rides into the city, the people don't get it. They're shouting Hosanna, and they should be, but they're not shouting it for the right reasons. And so this morning, the application we, that I want us all to have is maybe a little bit different than what you normally would think in a Palm Sunday sermon. I want us to think about unmet expectations. What are unmet expectations that you have from God? We all have unmet expectations in our life. In fact, um, as I was preparing for this sermon, I came across some interesting information that says that the number one reason for relationship failure, it's not, uh, it's not broken trust, it's not lying, it's not many of the things that you might think it is. The number one reason for broken relationships is unmet expectations. You expect something and then the, the reality doesn't add up. Maybe you expect from your spouse or something a certain way and, and over time they don't live up to that expectation and it, and it grates on you and grates on you and all of a sudden you're far apart. And that's why I think it's so important for us to address this when it comes to our relationship with God. Because while God promises he will never leave us or forsake us, the reality sometimes in our own hearts is more like the great hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Right? We all feel that way sometimes in our hearts. And we all have unmet expectations. Maybe you expected a job to come through and it didn't. And you're just kind of angry at God. Maybe there's a loss of a loved one in it and it just aches at you and you're like, God, why did you, why do you always take the good ones? Maybe there's a broken relationship and you've, you've prayed and prayed and, and it doesn't feel like God's answering your prayer. I don't know what your unmet expectations are, but we all go through pain and suffering in life, right? Hard times. And maybe sometimes we have bad feelings towards God as a result. But what I want us to focus on today is the idea that while the Jews, while the disciples, while all those people had unmet expectations, what God delivered and what Jesus gave them was far better than what they could have hoped for. They wanted a city. They wanted land. They wanted freedom. God gave them eternity. God made them his heirs. God called them his children. You see, and so when we have unmet expectations from God, I think the thing that we need to focus on is that Jesus' plan is always better. It might not feel that way in the midst of pain and struggle. When life isn't meeting your hopes and dreams. It doesn't feel that way. But Jesus' plan for our life is always better. Whatever dark times you're walking through, as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Romans 8 there's a great passage in Romans 8. Romans 8 is, as a whole is, is one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible, in my opinion. But there's a great passage that says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor struggle, nor toil, nor tribulation. Nothing, nor famine, nor nakedness, nor the sword. Nothing can separate us from God's love. 
Whatever challenge you're walking through, whatever unmet expectations you have, remember this today. And my First Communion students, remember this. God loves you desperately. Nothing can ever take away that love. He calls you his child, and you are his forever. And no matter what hard times you might face in life, no matter what challenges you face, remember that God is always there. And his plan is better than our plans. Amen.